programs and watch, welcome to this webinar on Connecting to WebAssembly. I'm Jim McKeith and joining me is Mark Hoffman of RoboObject Software. Hey, how are you doing? Good. So you, you're living in down in paradise now. I'm still up in- I do, Florida. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Need to come down and visit. Where, where is yeah, it you, you live now? Curacao. Curacao. And that's like down in the Caribbean, right? Yeah, it's like the very south, like just a little bit north of Venezuela. It's like the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao. Cool. I, I really have always liked the idea of moving someplace exotic, as long as I have good internet. <laughs> most, most days we do. Sometimes it can be a little flaky, but... Are you on Starlink or is it a ground line? No, not yet. It's, it's fiber, but it's island fiber. Okay, okay. I have a few people that I've talked to that have got Starlink that are pretty happy with it. So. Okay, that's good. I, I signed up for that. I think they're scheduled to launch, I think either later this year or maybe early next. So I, I signed up like for the, put the deposit down and everything. So they let me know when it's available, but we'll see. Well, yeah, besides we were going to talk about WebAssembly, uh, which some people may be new to WebAssembly or not be familiar with it, but WebAssembly is, I don't know, the, the evolution of JavaScript or replacement of JavaScript. How would you describe WebAssembly? Yeah, I wouldn't say replacement. It's a, an alternative to JavaScript. So, I mean, JavaScript isn't going away, but the idea is to have something that's more natively pre-compiled into a, a binary that you can run in the browser while still being safe, of course, and not running any arbitrary code, right? So previously, Microsoft had ActiveX controls that you could run in Internet Explorer, and there was Flash, and Java applets spent some time in the browser. But this is a natively compiled running in the browser, but it's not natively compiled to individual CPUs. It's like some sort of intermediate language. Exactly. Yeah. So ActiveX, so those were basically, they were compiled to Windows x86 code and they just ran and they could do whatever they wanted to pretty, pretty much. And then like, like Flash and all that stuff is pretty different extreme that it's like, it's interpreted in a way and then run in a, in a sandbox, but it's separate from the whole web, web experience, right? Like from the whole browser model. And the idea with WebAssembly is that you really, you're living in the same space as JavaScript more or less, except it's not JavaScript. But it's in the browser sandbox the same way JavaScript is. Yeah. So I guess like on, on, on some level you could compare it to, to, to Java or .NET in the sense that you have like certain, some sort of bytecode that isn't really any specific CPU, it's like a made up CPU specifically for WebAssembly. And then the browser goes ahead and processes that and, and compiles that just in time to run. And of course the browser then can also run checks and verifications on what the code actually does, which you couldn't do if it's just a black box oh, binary really code for the machine, or these would be very much more tricky to do. So it, the browser actually has visibility into what WebAssembly is doing like it does with JavaScript. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, so for example, you don't have like access to like files and things like that. There's no APIs for that to, to call those. So that's a way of restricting. You can't have code that, that does anything bad because you just don't have the access for that. ActiveX and Java was one of those ways before browsers had any local functionality outside the browser. People would be like, oh, we can do this. And now we can browse files on your local computer or, or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And like, nobody thought about the, how, how bad idea that was at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now I've heard some people refer to JavaScript as being like the assembly language for the web. And you have some other things that are transpilers where you can write it in one language and then transpile it into JavaScript. Right. WebAssembly replaces that idea is it's a more low level than JavaScript and is designed. Exactly. To... Really WebAssembly is more the, the assembly language of, or the machine language of the browser as in again, like the JavaScript gets compiled and the browser checks what it does, and generates native code to, to run fast. And that's the same with WebAssembly, except the WebAssembly already is more prepackaged and easier to, to compile than, than JavaScript, right? Obviously even the browser vendors put a lot of effort into making JavaScript compilation super fast. So things have gotten a lot better there, but still it, it's still text you have to parse versus bytecode that's pretty, pretty closely matches to what eventual CPU code is going to be, right? So that's always going to be easier to process or quicker to process. So what sort of languages compile to WebAssembly? In theory, anything could, but what are some of the languages that are out there that people might be using or familiar with? The main language usually is C, of course, that's like the, the, the go-to. And then of course there's our languages that, that, that do that. And 
I think there's a few efforts. I think Kotlin is doing WebAssembly as well at this stage. But to be honest, I'm not really like, too well versed into what else is out there. So on our end, we have, of course, we have Oxygen, which is pretty close to Delphi. And then we got C Sharp, Swift, Java, Go, and no a little basic that, that all compile to WebAssembly and all to other, other platforms as well. Forgot you added Go. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we, we added that, I think, a year ago. Yeah. So are you, are you planning to add Rust next? That seems a big, a big popularity in that one. <laughs> we, we, we got nothing to announce, but if we add something as a next language, it, it, it probably would be Rust. Yeah, I think that, that is pretty interesting. And I know that, that, that Carlo, our, our compiler chief architect, is, is pretty interested in Rust and has been playing with that. But nothing at this stage. I mean, we, we just we just added the Visual Basic support last month. We shipped that, so we've got to take it slow because Everything we do grows exponentially. When we add a new language, yeah. you get all the templates. You have no one dimension more. All the samples, all the all the tests, all the code completion. Everything is just like balloons out. So six languages already keep us pretty busy. Oh yeah, and then of course you have to test all your libraries with each language, and yeah, yeah, yep. to a degree, yeah, but mostly because that's on, on different levels. Usually that stuff just works, but yeah, you still gotta support everything everywhere, basically. We'll probably spend most of the time talking about Oxygen, but I'm curious though, what things you like about Swift versus Oxygen? Are you, I know you used to be very much a Oxygen fan, Pascal derivatives. Oh, I still am. I still, it's still my still. favorite language, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I see a lot of people that are, get excited about new languages. I'm just curious, since you've spent some good build time in each of these, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I'm out of two minds of Swift. I really liked it when it came out, but I think it's going into a very weird direction that's, I don't know, it, it seems like it's been, they, they try really hard to make it really complicated. So I'm not sure, I don't really, I don't really like where it's going, but uh, it's got some really nice ideas. Some of which we actually took over to Oxygen as well and, and to the other language. Uh, for example, one thing I think that makes it really nice is they have these thing called trailing closures, where basically if you have an anonymous method, you have those in Delphi too, right? where you can pass method as part of a function call. So you, instead of having to have it inside the parameters and having the, the closing parenthesis at the end, you can just attach it at the end of the, the method and it makes the method more look like a, like a, like a language feature, right? So if you, so for example, you have, if you have, if something you do, if condition curly brace, you have your code and you got curly brace n, right? And you could do the same with a function, with a method that takes a closure. You could, you just call your method curly brace, that is your code, and then you do end. So that, that's one of the really nice features they had early on that I really liked about Swift. And then there's some other things, but there's also lots of things that are taking it to, they're, they're going very functional these days too, which isn't really my cup of tea. And at the time I see that code, like, what is this supposed to do? I have no idea. <laughs> I like learning other languages and I learned to appreciate all the different things they have about them. And some, a lot of times things like you, you said, they're like, oh, that'd be great. And you want to bring it over either as a language feature or sometimes you see a way of doing things that you bring over it just in, in the language in general. But I, I'm the same way though. Pascal's always been my favorite. It's the, you know, what I go to. There's sometimes there's reasons to use other language, but generally speaking, if, if it's not a reason I need to do something else, if I'm running a, a shell script, that's going to be a certain language, but otherwise, no, yeah. yeah, back to Pascal. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same, except for one major code base, pretty much everything you had remote objects is all oxygen. So that's where I spend most of my time in. Yeah. Yeah. So now for those that aren't familiar with oxygen, it uh, originally had a different name originally, and then it was a while in Barcadero sold it as Prism, right? And then it was oxygen. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we started as Chrome back in, in 2004, I think. Yeah. And then at some, at some point we got an offer we couldn't refuse. So we renamed it to Oxygen. That was around version three. And also around that time, like I think half a year later, we had an agreement with Embarcadero to bundle it with Red Studio. And so we branded that Embarcadero Prism or first was called Delphi Prism and then Embarcadero Prism. We did that for a few years. And that was back then when it was only Oxygen and only for .NET. And then, and since then it's come a long way, obviously. I mean, we added all the other languages to it, all the, all the other platforms. So it's been an exciting, what, 16 years. Yeah, I bet. So it, it's, it is a, it's object Pascal based language that is shared a lot of things with Delphi. So Delphi is a, a dialect or evolution of object Pascal and oxygen takes from that and then builds on more as well. So it, if someone's yeah. familiar with Delphi, they're going to be pretty comfortable with oxygen, it sounds like. No, def definitely. Yeah. Basically what we did is we, we started with what was basically Delphi 7-ish, the state of the art back at the time. And basically we, we took that because I mean, that's the language we 
back then used and loved. Basically, we took that set and we just kept adding new features on top. So even though the first release we made back in 2004, 2005, already added a bunch of stuff and we've been keeping iterating and adding new things. I mean, kind of like those trading closures I mentioned and other things uh, pretty much every year or every month. So yeah. it keeps growing. But yeah, if, 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 if someone knows Delphi, uh, they're going to be instantly familiar. And, and to be honest, like most like Delphi language code is just going to compile as is, and we've got some options to make that even easier as well in, in some areas. Okay. But okay, so I guess if someone has like code that's very Delphi seven ish, you probably can can move across pretty easily. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to be honest, even even code that's Delphi ten ish is going to be fine usually. Uh, there's a few things we have that, that make anything that's that that Delphi seven ish is probably going to compile as is more or less. Just about the code, of course, not the the libraries you might be using and all that, right? Right. But just the code syntax. But of course, like. Since then, the languages have diverged a little bit. For example, we added generics. We used the C sharp like syntax with the square brackets, and I think Delphi went a little bit a different way. I think that these constraints are pretty are a little bit different than Delphi up later on. So we added compatibility options for that. So we have an option if you say, okay, I, I want to do it the Delphi way, you can set an extra flag, Delphi compatibility, and that's a huge list of things that are a little bit different or like that we don't usually support that we enable that way. That, but again, I think those are usually pretty much corner cases anyway. If you're just naively writing Pascal code, chances are it's just gonna, you're just going to be fine. You're, not, you're never even going to notice that it's a different compiler. Yeah, I, I, I guess maybe I should talk, mention why I always wanted to do this webinar. I'm not saying everybody should switch to auction, <laughs> but the, <laughs> I like the idea of, like, like you mentioned earlier, it's nice to have multiple languages you're familiar with because each one has different advantages and disadvantages and different targets. Right. And, like and so I see, having oxygen in your tool belt as a Delphi developer is a great way to add some other uh, nuances. Specifically, we're going to talk about WebAssembly. So how you can use right, yeah. oxygen to uh, connect your Delphi applications to WebAssembly. Exactly. So it's not about switching. It's not, I don't know if you have to pick one or the other, right? Just if you know Pascal and you got you want to write something for WebAssembly or some other thing, say you got to write something that runs as a Java applet somewhere, God forbid, then why not use a language you can, you, that you like and you, and you know well, right? When you talk to people about web apps is people think of it in different things. And so people a lot of times say full stack developer. And for a while I was like, what is a full stack developer? And then I'm like, wait, that I was doing that before. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, you know, exactly. Yeah. Full stack is the idea of the back end or middle tiers or whatever you want to call it. And then the front end. But when you're talking about web, that front end is in the browser. And so it is the JavaScript or the whatever functionality running in the browser, as well as usually the idea is that if you can do CSS and HTML, all that stuff, the different tiers, different layers of execution there. So WebAssembly is running in the browser and talking to the HTML and CSS and stuff like that. Now, if you're doing WebAssembly with Oxygen, or do you need to know the CSS and HTML or is that abstracted away? Is it visually done or how do you, what does that look like for a developer? Well, I think HTML, you, have, you pretty much have to know a little bit if you want to do anything in the browser and, and CSS as well to a degree. Um, and there's, there's other technologies that, that can abstract the HTML away from you. Say if you want to do ASP.NET on the server side to, to build your, your website and then embed some web assembly in that on the client side. You might get away with I don't know, knowing less about C about uh, HTML and CSS and JavaScript, but in, in general, you're still going to need those. You're not necessarily going to need much JavaScript because I mean you can do lots and most of things inside the WebAssembly. But but chances are, even then, if you build something complex like with really detailed HTML and, and complex structures, you might still want to throw in a little bit of JavaScript here and there, just like inside the HTML, just to glue things together. So it, it can't hurt if you know it, but it's not like you going to be living JavaScript every day if you're doing WebAssembly. I mean, that's the whole idea to not have to do that. That's an interesting point, actually. So you're saying we you do WebAssembly and have some HTML and then some JavaScript in the HTML. Would, do you, can you write WebAssembly in the browser what, embedded like you would in JavaScript or it's totally a different paradigm, it sounds like? Wait, what do you mean in the browser? I'm just thinking if I view source on a a web page, I can see the JavaScript embedded in the web page. That's not something oh, right, yeah. you with WebAssembly, right? Yeah, you can basically look at the binary, and I think that the, the, like the web inspector console gives you like, like a disassembly view of these other methods to be found inside this WebAssembly, but it's not like you can't see the source or anything like that, right? Because I mean, okay. that's it all gets compiled to 
the CPU code, and and, and that's all that's downloaded, basically. Let's try and fire. Can we fire up oxygen, and you can do a little walk us through. A little yeah, sure. Doing this. Yeah, share the screen. Let me this PD out of the way here. Yeah. So what I was going to do is going to just going to create a new project here. So we got web assembly here, and so we got two okay, options. Actually, got three, three, three options to look at. But look at later. So we got the a plain module that doesn't do anything for you, and we got the code behind model that provides some technology to interact with HTML better. So I'm, I'm going to use that. Just going to create that. So what you see here basically is you got a run of the mill HTML file. It's pretty mm -hmm. pretty simple. Just with an headline uh, button and so on. And up here we load we load in the WebAssembly module, and that's what's good getting compiled from the compiler. Uh, so down here, we got the code behind file. So for the index HTML file, we've got an index class that sort of gives you access to everything that's that's inside inside the HTML. So right here, we assign a click handler on the OK button. We set some properties in, in the constructor and, and, and that's it, All right? So let me run this off and you see, so if I bring this back, you see the code ran here. So it changed the name of the, the caption of the button and the L and then if I, Click the button, it's going to react to that as well and run the event handler we had here. So that's interesting. It changed it after the page rendered. There was a little bit of delay there. Is that, can you have it so it executes it as the page loads or does it have to be, wait for the page to render or how does that? Yeah, no, so, yeah, so basically what happened is here that basically on, on, on start, it, it, it downloads the module and initializes it and, and then runs it. So that's going to take some, that takes a second or so because it's got to compile. The module, but what you, what you could do in theory is, of course, you could you know, hide this and only show it after it's loaded, right? So I, I could put a diff around this and set it to hidden. And then the first thing in the code, I'd say, say remove the hidden flag of the diff or something like that, for example. You're probably not going to have HTML elements that you change immediately on JavaScript. You're probably going to have exactly. Those. No, I mean, this is a bit of, a bit of a concrete example, right? Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I didn't think of it. Yeah. Basically, the same thing with JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that's, I think. The one thing I like about the, the, having this in the template is that you actually see when it's loaded because yeah. when you can start interacting with it. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like in real life, you wouldn't enable the button until it can actually do something, for example. I see some JavaScript files there as well in the HTML file. Yeah. So, so basically those, those are files that are generated for you. They, they just contain boilerplate code that's sort of needed to load up the modules. For example, you see here the module 14 dot initiate. This is what actually goes out and downloads the, the wasm file from the server and then loads it up and compiles it and everything. And, and, and that's all inside those two, two JavaScript files. So, so those get both created for you on compile. So the, the first one is pretty much that static. That's the same for everybody. And then the second one is specific to your, to your module. So it knows all the classes that, that you have exposed there. What is the overhead then of using WebAssembly? Would you want to not use WebAssembly for like really simple interactivity in a web page and like only reserve it for when they're getting really carried away with a really complex uh, web app or would it make sense to use WebAssembly for all? Uh, yeah, I guess, it's, I guess it's a balance of what you consider simple and not simple and how much you like or dislike using JavaScript. It is literally like, I've got the static page, but there's this one button. If I click it, I want to change the caption or I want to make Spark or something, then it might just be easier to use two lines of JavaScript rather than all of this, but I think as soon as you have a certain level of complexity that goes beyond, oh, this, this is super trivial. I, th I think it's pretty much a wash. You just pick WebAssembly because you prefer it. And yeah, I guess that makes sense. Like if you had a uh, pre-existing JavaScript script, you just want to drop in there and boom, boom, you'd be. Oh yeah, big. yeah. So ActiveX components were specific to Internet Explorer. I see you're running in Brave. WebAssembly, does it run across most browsers today or all browsers or what's the? I think pretty much any modern current browser. So that's ex it excludes like IE6, of course, but <laughs> any, any sane browser in use today supports WebAssembly at this day. Yeah. As far as debugging from the IDE goes, you can basically use any Chromium-based browsers because that's the standard debug API they provide that we use. So you can't use Safari or Firefox. They don't have the debugging infrastructure, but, but otherwise the, the website itself works in, in, in Firefox and Safari and, and anything else that I can think of. And so what is the, can we look in the browser and see what the, uh, what this looks like from the developer view in the browser where it shows us like source code and stuff? Sure. Yeah, we can see. Let's see what we want to see. 
like the sources tab there. So for, for example, sources, I mean, here's all the things you saw that's published by the server. And then here, basically here's the WASM file that was downloaded. And you can see it's processing here and then it shows you all the functions and then entry points that are exposed inside the WASM. Not really disassembly, but like a, I don't know, generated header file you want to call it. Yeah. Like that. So that seems like a lot of code there for we didn't do a whole lot. Is that is there an optimizer that reduces the size of that WASM file since we're only doing no, of course, yeah. I mean, I mean for, for one, there's a debug build, so it doesn't really much do much optimization or even any, and there's debug symbols and all that as well, of course, so you can debug. But yeah, it's, again, like we provide a basic runtime library that sort of gives you some basic functionality you want to use in proper object Pascal or general object-oriented code that goes beyond what's just provided by the browser. Then that's, of course, there. But again, like, yeah, if, if you build for release, then a lot of that is going to get optimized away if you don't use it. Okay. All right. Now, so what is the debug? How does the debug experience look like then? Well, that, that, yeah, that's pretty much the same as you would as, as it would be for any other project. So you can just it's a breakpoints as you would like. So let's let's breakpoint here, for example, hit run. And it's just going to hit the breakpoint, and then you can see your stack trace here. You can see your locals. And of course, you can I don't know, step through. I'm not sure why this thing is going to my steps. The thing is, I know the whole piece all that dynamic calls to the JavaScript, and right? I think there might be some optimizations yet to be done for the stepping. But yeah, in, in, in general, the, the debugging experience is what you would expect. And so, like, could you change the value there, or does it have to recompile? It would have to recompile, wouldn't it? Or if you were to change like the the code, the title, or yeah, no, to, to to change this, no, I'm not sure if I could. Again, this is new territory because this is all. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that the problem is that the, the debugger doesn't have access to the the properties here because those are dynamic. So uh, I'm afraid those aren't really exposed in in the inspector here because you got to remember, like at, at runtime, these are JavaScript. Like head is a JavaScript object, right? Like you don't really have any information. What does it like? The debugger doesn't have any information. What does this object look like? to like list properties like you would in a Delphi class or something. So you're a little bit limited there. But, but in theory, you, you could, I think, call 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 functions uh, if there was exposed here from the debugger. Now, when you're writing the code, then does it, if I type uh, body dot, does it give me style as an option? It, it, it does, yeah. So we, we, we're hacking here a little bit. So let me show you how this works behind the scenes. So, so basically, you see inside the HTML, I put ID tags in. On some of the elements here, right? So you got an ID, an ID button, and basically what we do on, at compile time is we go ahead and we generate a second source file. It also has a class index HTML. That's, that's a partial class shared with with your code. And here you have code generated for each of the elements. And here you actually have strongly typed elements. So it knows headline is a button. Headline is a headline element. Button is a button element. And so when you type, it knows what properties are available there. And of course, it also knows that those that those elements are there in the first place, but at that different level, and at, at, at runtime, those those things disappear at, at this stage. I like the idea of partial classes. That and I like that you're hiding that away. But where? How did you get to that again? I didn't. I saw you're showing it, but then I don't see. Yeah. So, so, so basically, we have this up here in the, in the project, you can do other files, and then any, any files that aren't part of your project but were generated for you. That that's a couple other scenarios and on, on other platforms where that name, happens. Name, name, huh? Those sort of, those show up here. Yeah. Okay, it has exactly the same name though. Okay. No, you know, it basically it uses the it uses the name of the of the HTML file dot pass. Actually, it, it does have the same name. I like to mention it. But yeah, but that's coincidence. Yeah, but it's it's in a different folder. Basically, it can it gets generated somewhere else. Okay. Okay. So what we, we can do I can do if I do a build, I, I can show you that. Oops, I broke something. If I do a build, there's going to be a phase somewhere where it says, yeah, process HTML. So basically it's generating a new source file in, in, in our temporary folder where all the build detria stuff goes. And it's just sort of injecting this into the compiler as if it was part of your project, even though it wasn't. Now, as you're editing the HTML, when is it, you have to build before that updates so that you can use it from code or? Right now that's updated on build, yeah. Okay. So you, if you made but, the change yeah, but, in HTML, you'd hit build, and then you could write edit the code would refine. Yeah, that. so if so if I rename this to headline two, 
I'll get an error first because now I change. And then now after the compile, actually I'd have to compile it first successfully. And then, oh, I don't know what doesn't, uh, demo mode. I don't know what's happening here, but that, that should work in theory. I have to look into that. I, I do know that you probably have been editing on this, your, on the whole thing recently. <laughs> uh, I used to work one place where my manager would always bring a customer in and say, hey, demo this new feature. And I'm like, it doesn't even compile right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I totally understand that. So what kind of so using WebAssembly and Oxygen, you can add that functionality in the browser. For somebody that is a, has an existing Delphi application where they want to add a web application to that, what would be like the ideal scenario? Would they just take their existing application and recompile it and all of a sudden it works in the browser? Or what would they, what would you think they'd probably want to do for that? Yeah, it, it probably would be a little bit more complicated than that. Because obviously if you're building a Win32 application with VCL and FryerMonkey and lots of fancy stuff and... Dev Express grid views and whatnot. But the idea is that you could probably take your business logic pretty easily and use that either in the WebAssembly or put it somewhere on the server and then have code in the WebAssembly that talks to the server and, and, and reuse that, right? But you wouldn't probably want to reuse your, I don't know, your GUI code and things like that. So if they had, they could like, if they had a, like a data snap server running or data abstract or a RAD server, REST server, something like that, they could just with their business logic in, they could then build a client in WebAssembly to connect to that. It sounds yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so I, I, for data abstract, we actually, we do have a data abstract for JavaScript client implementation, actually, that you could use. And, and that's fully accessible from WebAssembly as well. And again, you have access to all the, all the JavaScript object model and APIs that you, that you have, right? So you can easily use that. And for, for, for data snap, the same, I'm, I'm not too familiar with data snap these days anymore, but I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming you have some sort of rest base API or something you can talk to, and then you can use the browser APIs, the HTTP request APIs to, to talk to that and get the data. Yeah. And we have red server, which is also a rest based as well. Yeah. Yeah. The same with by there. Yeah. Now, what about, you mentioned Dev Express grids, is there are there grids that I can use that are like really nice and robust that I can take advantage of from a WebAssembly client application? I'm not really sure. I'm not really familiar with what the component landscape out there is, to be honest, on the JavaScript side, because that, that's really not my area of expertise. But in, in, gen in general, again, the same goes, if you get a, a suite of components that work from JavaScript, you, you can use them from WebAssembly as well, right? That's, like, what, that's what I was wondering, yeah. Yeah, but the, the level we're at here is basically we, we are code talking to the DOM and that's it. Everything is everything else is that's one step away from, from what we're talking about here right now, right? So we don't have a GUI framework or anything like that. This is really just, this replaces the JavaScript part, but it doesn't replace the jQuery part or the, I don't know, whatever other sort of libraries you might be using. So you could use jQuery from WebAssembly? I would think so, yeah. I, I don't okay. see why you wouldn't. Again, like there's, there's just some, some JavaScript space objects that you can use. Yeah. So oh, Idera, Embarcadero's parent company, has Sencha and a couple other JavaScript brands. So it would sound like, in theory, I could use the Sencha, like, grid from... I, I would think so, yeah. Yeah, that might be, it might be interesting for Triton sometime, maybe not today, but... <laughs> yeah, not right now, but yeah, we definitely, we need yeah. to come back and test that one out. That would be really cool. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Now, so you could have some shared code between Delphi and... Oxygen for the WebAssembly. So if you like to sign, define like some objects or business logic, you could do that as well. And exactly, you, yeah, uh, yeah. So as I said, like the, like the, the language I mean, Oxygen is pretty much a, a superset of Delphi, except for a few really tiny corner cases. So in general, if you got some pure Pascal or Delphi code, that's defined your business logic or yeah, some math algorithm you want to re reuse or just like data model of your, I don't know, customers, orders, whatever classes. Chances are you can just throw it in and it's just going to compile or compile after a couple of changes or with a couple of if that's necessary. Yeah. And the nice thing is because again, because Elements supports all, the, all, all these different languages, the same is true if you have something in C Sharp that's like your business logic or some algorithm you want to use, you can just drop that in as well. So you also have the Hydra project, which lets you 
combine languages or .NET and Delphi, .NET and native and stuff like that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's good. Like it's quite different angle. So Hydra is about mixing Delphi, like native Delphi for Windows, .NET and Java code in the same process. So say if you have a Delphi application and you want to use, say you want to give one form you want to implement in .NET so you can use WPF, for example, or you've got this, this legacy Java applet sort of thing you got to host somewhere else, or not, not applet, but like a swing thing that's written a decade ago that you got to, you want to want integrate in the same application. You can use Hydra to basically make your application pluggable and then get those different platforms in there. But that, that's orthogonal to this though. Yeah. But, but with an elements, what you can actually do is always in terms of mixing languages, you can actually use all the languages in the same project. So you don't have to like, have, oh, this is a C-sharp project, this is, a, this is Oxygen project, it's just an elements project. So for example, here, I could just go ahead and say, new file, let's say class, and then I could switch from Oxygen to say, what do we want to say C-sharp, for example. And now we got a C-sharp class there. Oh, that's cool, that's useful. So if you had existing, again, like say, say you found some code that does something you got to do on, on the net, at the algorithm with C sharp, you don't have to translate it. You just drop it in, and you're done. So do you have again, some more presumably it's going to. Sorry, go ahead. No, I said again. Again, that's assuming it's going to compile for WebAssembly, of course. But language-wise, oh, yeah. it can be C sharp. And of course, it's going to use I don't know some weird .NET API that's not going to be on WebAssembly. Right? Yeah, so that's a good point. Is that you, the language syntax is one level of compatibility, but if you were had some existing code. That was making like Win32 API calls or something like that, or exactly, yeah. Windows messages that would not work. Yeah, no, that, that, I think the thing is always important to people all, often go ahead and lump together. Oh, like C Sharp and .NET, that's the same thing, or Java and the Android SDK, that's the same thing. But it's right. not right. You got the language, and that's really just the language. And who do you talk to? What the classes are? That's your platform. So here we're on the WebAssembly platform, but the language is Pascal or C Sharp or whatever. Do you have any support for GUI frameworks, like VCL type uh, frameworks with WebAssembly or something like that? We can, can build it. Sort of. We have a little bit of a prototype, and it's really not much more than a prototype. Uh, let me show you that. So what we have is because we have like really basic Delphi, RTL, and VCL compatibility layers. And what we've done here basically is we have support for DFMs. So this is literally a DFM copied straight from Delphi, including the source code. I think. Pretty much the only thing changed here is the is the users clause, and let's see if we can run this. Oops, this worked yesterday. Oops. You had the attributes applied twice. Yeah, yeah. I think I missed that up earlier when I was playing with that. Oops. I smell this working this morning. <laughs> put that, put the, you, you remove both instances of the export. Maybe you put one of them back. Oh, oh I have two of them there. Okay. I yeah, know. Yeah. No, yeah. Makes sense now. I, I do that all the time where I'm like, but, 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 but at least you saw the debugger was working, right? That was what, that's what I wanted to show you. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically so everybody knows this example, right? So. It's just basically standard VCL uh, DFM with a couple labels, button, edit, list box. And then basically in the background, uh, the, the Delphi VCL wrapper creates the HTML for that for you and builds it up. And again, that, that's like a very limited prototype at this stage, but I think looking forward, if there's demand and interest, and that's something we are exploring and expanding. Is, is the source code for that prototype included with it? So, you know, if someone's like, oh, that's, I could get partway there and figure out the rest of it. Is that something that they would have access to? Yeah, that, that, that's all open source on GitHub, actually. Okay. Yeah. And actually, that, that same library actually works for a couple of platforms. So that works for native Windows, and I believe at this point for native Mac OS as well. So you literally you can take the, ta the same DFM and, 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 and T-form class, and it's, it's going to work on, on all three of them. Okay, that's great. Do you have some more involved uh, demos that maybe show some other cool WebAssembly type stuff? 
Not really that many. Just, uh, one, one thing I prepared yesterday I wanted to show you is we, we talked earlier about doing requests to right. servers. So I, I, I whipped up something here. So basically this is the, the XML HTTP request, which is really misnomer because it's got nothing to do with XML really. So basically, basically that's a ready-made object provided by the browser that you can just create an instance of here and then basically tell it to grab a URL of a server and, and, and work with it. So basically here, what we do is we just, we just create a new instance of that. We assign three events, what, what happens when it's done, what happens if there's an error, and, and we could also get progress report if we wanted to, and then you just call open and send, and then basically it's gonna, the browser is gonna go out and download this URL from the server, and then when it's done, it's gonna basically execute this and replace this text on the website. So let me see if this one runs, I managed to break that too. Okay, so if I hit click me, this, this is the text from the XML. If I check here, that's the XML file it downloaded. Mm, okay. okay. The, so actually go back to the HTML or index HTML dot pass. If you oh, okay. Quickly. Yeah. The pass file. Oh, the pass. Yeah, sure. So I'm looking at this and I it see that we're writing the code in the type declaration here. And that's something you're pulling off via the partial classes, right? Oh, actually, no, no actually that's a new sort of newish language feature we added to Oxygen a while back, I think two or three years ago, we call it unified classes. So you don't have to separate the implementation and the interface anymore, but, but you still can. That, that, that just happens to be the, the, the style that I used here. You, you could go ahead and say, uh, and you know, like this, like the more the traditional how you would have it in Delphi, right? With the with the implementation and the and the declaration. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I kind of like the unified thing, but I was just like, wait a second, that's different. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I, I like it too. I'm, I'm, I was gonna say, I, I use it like, I wanna say 75% of the time, so it depends on what I'm writing. Like if I'm writing something that's very much, this is an API for someone else to use, and I sometimes like to still have it separated, like to have a list of the function at the top, but if it's just like a class on its own, that's just gonna be, be there. I usually pre prefer the unified way. Not less, not less clutter, but again, that's just like a personal choice. You can use whichever version you like. Yeah. We uh, remember when Delphi got the inline variable declaration and type inference and stuff like that. They're like, oh, oh yeah, no, that, that's... no, never use that, never use that. And like, it's an option, it's a choice. Yeah, yeah it's, to be honest, it's a game changer. We've had this since the first version. It's one of my favorite features, actually, especially the type inference. That, and why, why type the tab name twice if you don't have to? Like, yeah, exactly. And so that's the thing is a lot of people are like, it's not clear what the type is. It's like, if it's not clear what the type is, then you're writing the code wrong, then declare the type. But if it, it otherwise you're typing the type name twice, so you don't need to do that. Especially, so, yeah. so like what is gained if I add this here? This doesn't really help anybody. It just makes it more cluttered, so. Exactly. And then if you change it in one place, you have to change it in the other place too, which is the other thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that too, yeah. Yep, yeah, agree. All right, very cool. Is there yeah. anything else you wanted to show with this or talk about before we wrap up, I guess? Yeah, so, so, so maybe, maybe a little bit background on, on, on how this whole debugging thing works. So, so one of the things about WebAssembly is that you, for, for some reason, I don't understand, there's a little bit in the browser, you can't load WebAssembly from a local file. It only allows you to load WebAssemblies via HTTP. So actually what we do, as you see down here, when, we, when you debug, we actually launch an HTTP server that basically serves this entire web folder. And then we send the browser to it. And that way basically the, the browser can load the, the index and the wasm file or anything else from, from that browser. And basically that's where this request here goes to. What is it there? Right, okay. So in production WebAssembly, does, there's no server element to it, but in debugging, you do have a web server, but that's all. Even in production, your page is going to come from some, from some server, so you're going to yeah. be fine. So, but, but, but what you can do is you can, oh, I just have an HTML file on my disk and I double click it to open it in Chrome. 
And then for some reason, then Trope says, no, I'm not doing WebAssembly here. That's insecure or something. I, I don't know what the reasoning behind that is. I don't, I don't understand it, to be honest, but that's been there from day one. And I don't know why, but that's just something to know, basically. Hmm. Now, do you have to deal with the cores cross-site origin scripting things and stuff like that? Is that it? something you, you you do yeah so, so if i would if i would change this to a remote url like some some other server request would fail and you would need the proper headers on the server and on your page or whatever that is to, to basically enable that but don't ask me what those are right now but when you can google course or cross origin and you, you can yeah. find that but yeah that's i actually ran into that when i created this example because first i used an xml file or, or server like no this isn't working oh yeah yeah that's the course thing I thought I was looking at your string syntax there with the right one, and then you have the dollar sign symbol, and then you have the square bracket or the curly brackets inside, and that's escaping it to say that's a concatenation there. So it's basically yeah, it's like a yeah. different format. Yeah, the, the, those are interpolated strings. So basically, if the string starts with a with a dollar sign, then whatever you have in the curly brackets actually gets injected in those positions. So you basically you get one string created from the whole thing at runtime. So it's, it's basically also just a quick way of writing string.format and then right. getting all your numbers right in the right order and everything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Interesting. I, I, I love little language things like that. It's always interesting to see how different things do things. <laughs> yeah, and also just, just for the record, I use the strings here, double quotes. So in oxygen, you can use both. But for some reason, I prefer double quotes because then, then I don't have to change gears when I switch in between C sharp and then other languages in Oxygen. But but this is here, single quotes work fine as well. So yeah. that, that the tool is, is pretty compatible. So. Yeah, I, I, JavaScript does that as well. You can use either type of string, which I thought was a nice touch. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Yeah. Also, it, it's nice if you just need a single quote in, inside your string or a double quote. You can just pick the right quote type that matches, so you don't have to deal with the escaping and everything. But you meant not a big deal, but I've had sometimes when you, I have, it gets really awkward when you expect to do multiple yeah, levels of escaping. Especially if there's more than one, yeah. Yeah. Or if you're doing like the empty quote, it says, so okay, so I got to do escape and then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So if someone wants yeah. to get started with some WebAssembly with Oxygen, what would they need to do? Basically, just download a free trial version uh, and, and get started. And as I, mean, I should say, like right now, I've been using this on the Mac, but this all works, of course, on Windows as well. We've got our own IDE for Windows as well. That looks pretty much the same, but it's all native for Windows. And also, if you do like Visual Studio, we integrate with that as well. So if that's your cup of tea. So those are the, the, the options for working in. But yeah, just, just download the trial and, and give it a go. Okay. And... The, so the trial comes with all languages then, is that right? Yeah, it's all languages and all platforms, yeah. All languages, all platforms, okay. Yeah, and, and then when you do decide to purchase, you can decide if, if you want just Oxygen or if you want basically the package with all the platforms, but just a little bit extra, basically. Is there a, but we watched you build a uh, sample here with the, with WebAssembly. Is there a, some samples that ship, it ships with that show some different use cases or? It does, yeah, yeah. One of them actually is this this, this prototype that shows with the, with the VCL. There's, there's a couple others as well, yeah. And 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 basically, this is the starting point. We started with that's if you just create a new project from template, then that's what's all there, already there for you. So that helps you getting started as well. Yeah. All right. And then do you have documentation up on Rim Objects website. Of course, yeah. yeah. So we, we got basically we got docs.remobjects.com. We got documentation about all the languages and all the platforms as well. So this. Like details how the how the debugging works that we talked about with the server, how to talk to the to the DOM and to the browser objects and things like that. Okay, fantastic. Actually, that's another thing that might that might make sense to show real quick. Uh, create another example there, based on when we talked earlier. Let me close this. So basically, here uh, yeah, I've added a second method to the class for our page, so it's method foo, and what that does is. It just replaces the, the inner HTML again. And what I wanted to show you is that how you can basically, you can just call this from JavaScript or from your HTML. So basically here, I just added an href that that just calls this method as part of the of, of the link click. And then that, that marshals into your into your WebAssembly code and your method just gets run. So it can, it can run this. Interesting that you're telling HTML that it's a JavaScript call, but the JavaScript is gonna be using the WebAssembly. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, basically, you can, you can think of it as inline JavaScript. You could do the same. You could say foo, and then you have, say, something foo. Uh, and it would be the same thing. Basically. Now, is WebAssembly always object oriented? Um, I, th I think what you, have, what you expose is always going to be a class with the initials again. So you're gonna have a public class with, with the export and then all the public members are gonna be exported. Mm -hmm. But but I mean, but you, you can add global methods to, to, okay. to the code, that's no problem. So you could just go ahead and say, uh, I don't know. And then do whatever, whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. Right. But really I think, I think being object oriented is usually a, a good idea in general. Yeah, I, I like the idea of object oriented. I mean, it gives you the, the namespace type behavior as well, where you can. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you get that, you get that with the globals too. But yeah, I think it's, I know, I'm, I'm an object kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. And maybe one other thing to show is that so we saw how you can call it to WebAssembly from, from JavaScript from HTML. This, you can do the same in the reverse. So, but you can do, actually, no, it's, you get this WebAssembly class that has some helper functions, and one of them is eval. And that's basically the same eval function that you also have in JavaScript. So you can put anything here that you can call in JavaScript and just call it. For example, let's just say bar. And now if we go in here again and say bar, probably shouldn't do that. Um, oops. Oh. If you give if you blink, then this is going to call back into JavaScript again and execute the bar function. So you, you can go both ways. Mm -hmm. your JavaScript can call your WebAssembly, and your WebAssembly can call uh, your, your JavaScript. Yeah. It, interesting. I, I like this because it gives you you have some clear delineations between where you're what you're doing what. So that, that's nice. Yeah. And then there's also more on, there's another object that I was looking at, it's, it's just the browser object, and that, that gives you uh, access to some of the, basically the, the root APIs that, that the browser exposes, right? So you can use the uh, create element to add a new element to the code or get element by, by ID you would usually use to, I don't know, to find the headline, for example. Right? And you could go, I don't know, append child and, and whatnot. And th this is actually what's used under the hood for, for the code behind. So let me look at this again. See, this one just called uh, get element by ID as well. So everything that you give an ID, it gets and puts it in that code behind thing. Wow. Yeah, so basically it, it does the header, the body, and anything that has an ID uh, it goes in there, yeah. Okay. If you do, so you could put actual, could you put JavaScript that runs dynamically in your WebAssembly? So write JavaScript, like maybe have something that's uh, composing JavaScript and then have that JavaScript executed at runtime? Yeah, I, that, that's actually literally what this is doing. So this is running this line as JavaScript. So, so you, you could do other stuff here. I don't know. That's what I thought it was. I want to make sure I was understanding correctly. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, in theory, you could put more complex stuff in there, like build a huge string with functions and nested, whatever not. And if the JavaScript engine can handle it, you can dump it in there and it's going to run. Very cool. So now you have your, I know a lot of people use Realm Objects SDK, for example, for remoting and stuff. And that's something that is, if they're already using that, they can just plug that right into here to build a web client and talk to their backend server. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, so both for data abstract and for the remoting SDK, we have the, the JavaScript client SDKs, uh, and you can just use those. You just, you just add it up here. I don't know, you copy it in your folder and include it as from wherever you put it, include the, the remote sdk.js file or data abstract.js file. And then you, you can use it from here, the same APIs that, that you would use from JavaScript, basically. So I don't know, fetch your data table, call your remote methods, things like that. Well, we need to later and do a demo with uh, Sentra and RAD server. That would be great. 
Actually. That'd be great. Yeah, and I think I'm thinking, I'm thinking it would be good to look into actually having a demo that with that with data abstract and the SDK as well, like, because that's something I know it we were I know it works, but I never actually used it. Because as I said, as I said before, like I'm not really like WebAssembly isn't really my day to day cup of tea. So I don't really use it much for anything. So I learned a lot this week too. <laughs> so. Cool. All right. Yeah, let's let's plan on revisiting that. Maybe we just do a video on YouTube or something that shows that off or something like that. That would be great. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Well, so, so any any other questions you have or anything else you want to? I don't think so. So we'll definitely do some live Q and A for with the attendees. And uh, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Goes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And yeah. Talk to you soon. All right, yep.